Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the twelve, A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher, and the slave like the master, if they have called the master of the house of Beelzebul. How much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others... I will also ignore, acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father, and daughter against his mother, her mother, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you, O Christ. It may be Father's Day, and while all you dads out there are awesome and we have nothing but love for you, today instead we are going to focus our attention on a mother. And not just any mother, but a strong resilient, steadfast mother named Hagar. But to any of you dads out there, I do hope you especially listen in. Because I think through honestly and directly focusing today on this story of Hagar, I believe we promote the best in fathers by calling out the brutal, patriarchal, racist, and classist conditions that Hagar was subjected to. Now, the story of Hagar, it's a story of slavery, a story of surrogacy, a story of status, and most of all, a story of survival. But what we heard today in our first reading from Genesis is actually the second of two dramatic desert stories of Hagar. The first occurs a bit earlier in the 16th chapter of Genesis. And without this context, it's really hard to grasp the fullness of Hagar's unyielding life. So I'd like to begin there. Back before Abraham and Sarah are visited by three divine beings who announce that Sarah will bear a son, and they laugh at how ludicrous that sounds in their old age. Before this miraculous promise of a son, and before Isaac was eventually born, Sarah was desperate. She was desperate to fulfill her duty in a patriarchal society where her role was to bear children and to be obedient to Abraham. But at this point in the narrative, she's resigned herself to the reality that she will never bear a son. So she offers her slave, Hagar, to Abraham. You see, in this relationship, Sarah believes that Hagar belongs to her as property. Therefore, a child born of Hagar by her husband Abraham would also belong to Sarah as well. 
This was actually a common practice in situations like this in antiquity. So the text then says that Abraham went into Hagar. But as Lutherans, we have to name a thing for what it is. What was done to Hagar at the hands of Abraham and Sarah here is non-consensual rape. Hagar has no bodily autonomy as a slave. She has no ability to consent or say no when she is offered to Abraham. But when Hagar then conceives a child with Abraham, all of a sudden, Hagar no longer looks up to Sarah in the way that she once did. Sarah feels this status change. Sarah's response to this is to shift the relationship back to where it was, to quote-unquote deal harshly with Hagar. But again, to name a thing for what it is, this is physical abuse with the intent of dehumanizing Hagar, to put her back in her place as Sarah's powerless object. But Hagar is not powerless, and she refuses to be put back into a subjected place. She's a fighter, a resister, and so instead of remaining there with her rapist and her abuser, she flees her brutal enslavement and runs away into the desert. Now this is where we have to start taking notes, because this next moment in the story says a lot about who God is. Because when Hagar is in her most vulnerable state here, she's in exile, in the desert, without any help, that is when God shows up. The Lord finds Hagar near a spring, and God instructs her to return to Sarah and Abraham and deliver the child, and to name the child Ishmael meaning God hears. At that moment, Hagar is no longer just an exiled slave. She is a woman of God's promise. And this is where Hagar does something unprecedented. She names God. Hagar is the only person in the Bible to give a name to God. And the name she gives to God is El Roy, meaning God who sees me. Dang, that's powerful. So Hagar does, as God instructs. She returns to her brutal owners, and she gives birth to Ishmael. So it's with this context, then, that we pick the story back up today. Albeit it is a bit later, so Sarah has now given birth to her own son Isaac, and it's during the celebration of Isaac's weaning from Sarah that Sarah witnesses Isaac and Ishmael playing together, or more literally in the Hebrew uh, context, Ishmael was making Isaac laugh. This sight, it incenses Sarah. She cannot bear the thought of Hagar's son, Ishmael, sharing the inheritance with her son, Isaac. So she orders Abraham to send Hagar and Ishmael back into the desert. And much like when God perplexingly instructs Hagar to return to her rapist and abuser the first time, God does another perplexing thing here by then appearing to Abraham and actually instructing him to do as Sarah has commanded and to cast Hagar out. So Abraham obeys God and Sarah. And let's be honest, with only a skin of water and some bread, the exile of Hagar back into the wilderness with her son Ishmael by Abraham here is the equivalent of a death sentence. Because inevitably, the water runs out. So instead of watching her son die of dehydration, Hagar casts Ishmael under a bush. And can you blame her? After all Hagar has had to endure, the last thing she needs is to be a witness to her son's death. So she even cries out to God, do not let me look upon the death of a child. And she weeps. But if you remember, 
Ishmael's name means God hears. And God does hear these boys, this boy's cries from under the bush. God then appears to Hagar in making a way out of no way. God opens Hagar's eyes to see a well of water right there in the desert. And she fills the skin with water and gives Ishmael a drink. Hagar and Ishmael then live out their lives in the wilderness. And Hagar eventually finds Ishmael a wife like herself from Egypt. This story, ultimately, God does provide what Hagar and Ishmael need. God gives them what they need to survive, but we can't go so far as to say that this is a story of liberation. There is no promised land, but Hagar does find a way to survive her enslavement and her wilderness experiences with God's help. Several scholars have searched for the answer as to why God does not liberate Hagar in the first place. But it's womanist theologian Dolores Williams who offers us a concept, a concept of survival theology, to allow us to begin to understand Hagar's wilderness experience and to give meaning to what seems on the surface to be Hagar's abandonment. Womanist theologians like Dolores Williams, they approach their theology from their intersectional experience of oppression as being black women. And for many womanist theologians like Williams, Hagar has been a cherished biblical character. Williams explains here, the African American community has taken Hagar's story unto itself. Hagar has spoken to generation after generation of black women because her story has been validated as true by suffering black people. She and Ishmael together, as family, model many black American families in which a lone woman slash mother struggles to hold the family together in spite of the poverty to which ruling class economics consign it. Hagar, like many black women, goes into the wide world to make a living for herself and her child with only God by her side. You see, even though God does not deliver liberation, God provides survival techniques so that the oppressed can work towards liberating themselves. That means for those of us who are white like me, we too can find hope in the story of Hagar, that God hears us and sees us too. But we must not appropriate Hagar's story as our own. As tough of a pill as it is to swallow, we cannot locate ourselves in this story in the role of the oppressed Hagar. Instead, we must recognize that we are Abraham and Sarah, the story's oppressors. This is a reality we must take seriously and allow it to transform us into people of repentance for the sin of racism. This week we had the opportunity to do just that. On Wednesday, we came together with many others from the ELCA and the African Methodist Episcopal Church. We commemorated the Emmanuel Nine, the nine black people killed in 2015 by a white supremacist while in Bible study at Mother Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina. Just two days later then, on Friday, we observed and celebrated Juneteenth, the day attributed to the moment that word finally reached Texas that slavery had been abolished two and a half years after President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. These events are a reminder that there is work still to be done even now. 155 years after that first Juneteenth moment, and only five years since a white supremacist with an ELCA upbringing took the lives of nine sacred black siblings, we are still so far from a day when black lives will truly matter, especially the lives of black women who suffer from the intersecting marginalization 
of racism, sexism, and classism. In the murder of the Emmanuel Nine, if it teaches us anything, that this murder was done at the hands of a former ELCA Lutheran. And that reveals to us that the sin of racism is much closer to home than many of us would like to admit. There is not a problem just outside of our beloved church, but it's within our church, and it needs to be dealt with and dismantled here first. And if Juneteenth can teach us anything, it's that even with the end of slavery, it did not actually end slavery. Emily P. Cook, a professor at Denison University, she says, while slavery may be over, America has made many economic slaves of its people, and a vast majority of the black community is shackled by poverty and lack of opportunity. So those who continue to be denied full and complete liberation and continue to experience this slavery by another name, they can find hope in the Hagar narrative because they can trust that God is a provider of all they need to survive and to help liberate themselves. In other words, this survival theology means that the oppressed do not always experience God's liberating power, but often must draw that power from within themselves with God's help. This might seem a little less God-centered than the theology that we're normally used to, but I think it just puts a new spin on the ELCA's tagline, God's work, our hands. And especially in a racist, sexist, classist society where those on the margins have still not experienced full liberation, this survival theology is a valid theology of resistance and hope given our reality. So for our black sisters, may the powerful story of Hagar go with you. Because as a single mother on her own in the wilderness, Hagar may have not experienced liberation, but she was found by a God who saw her struggle, heard the cry of her dying son, and helped her survive. And that says a lot about who God is and who God shows up for. And for us all, may Hagar's story challenge and agitate us to dismantle the same patriarchal, racist, classist structures that held Hagar down and that continue to especially hold our black sisters down today. We need you to survive. And together, we can move forward with the help of God, trusting that the moral arc of the universe ultimately bends towards justice. Amen.